Welcome, 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 welcome. I'm so happy that y'all are here with me. I know y'all are happy to hear my voice. So, um, let me get right to it. Now, um, YouTubing is difficult because there's so much competition. So, it really helps when y'all like the video. So, if you can, when you can, because you got a finger. And you know, and if you ain't got a finger, you can use your nose or whatever. And go ahead and hit that like button. Like the video for me. And you really helping me out, helping me show up and uh, beat out some of this competition. People ask me all the time, man, why you only got 2,000 subscribers? And it's, hey, man, you know, if people don't hit like the video and people ain't watching every time I put something out, you know, it hurts. So what I'm going to do? Is after this upload here, I'm gonna let this one out today. But in the future, from now on, my videos will release Mondays and Fridays, and maybe a Wednesday if I got if I'm ahead of the game or whatever. But I think I'm gonna do Wednesday. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do that on my podcast, and I'll give y'all the link to the podcast when it's time. And um. Tuesday and Thursday, I'm going to try to do uh, releases on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights channel. So, I'm going to have that schedule, and the release time is going to be 7 p.m. for my YouTube channel. Maybe the same for Craig channel, for Chilling Tales channel. And uh, on the podcast, I usually let that go in the morning. So, that's the schedule. So from after today, you know, we're going to look for Mondays, Monday nights, Friday nights for show. Sure. Y'all make sure you tune in. Make sure you watch the video. Make sure you like the video because that'll really help your brother grow, man. So far, YouTube and I've made about $200 on my channel. And, uh, <laughs> you know, $200 for two years ain't a whole lot, but... uh. You know, I'm I'm thankful for it, man. So y'all just keep uh keep supporting me, man. I'm gonna do my best to keep this thing rocking, man. I work uh you know, six days a week most of the time and uh you know, ten hour days, twelve hour days, man. So I got to, because I gotta pay this rent, so <laughs> you know, I gotta pay the rent, man, and uh that's the only way I could uh you know, my job don't pay no whole lot of money. So you got to get them a whole lot of time if you want to make enough money to, uh, you know, make ends meet or whatever. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read the third the third uh, entry from my sister, Miss Natty. Now, Miss Natty then sent me two stories before this. And they was on uh, the first one was one of the scariest things I ever you know, I have a, I, it was it was terrifying, man. And the second one, the second one was it was scary too, but it was more it was more mysterious. The first one was mysterious too, but the second one was just like like just you know you can't even come up with an answer for you know how do you even you know and then uh, so this one. I don't know what to expect. It's about 11 something at night. And I'm going to try to get through it. But if it's too scary, <laughs> if this book too scary, uh, I'll be finishing this tomorrow, man. So hopefully it ain't too bad. And I can go ahead and finish it and ain't got to wait till the uh, daytime, man. Now, in the description, I'm going to put the links to the first two stories. So y'all can check them out if you ain't heard them. Or just to refresh you on what I'm talking about. And also, I'm putting a link to... Um, that. Okay, that's what I'm doing on Wednesdays. Wednesday is going to be the day when I drop videos for the folks who members. So all channel members going to get the videos on Wednesday nights. So yeah, that's how I'm going to do that. That's what happened on Wednesday nights. So anyway, so that's the new hood horror schedule, man. Monday, Friday... Night, then Wednesday night for the um, for the for the channel members, the ones who signed up, right there next to where it say subscribe, it say join channel, and then the Wednesday morning to be the podcast. So your brother about to go ahead and um, 
<clears throat> do what I got to do to make this thing get where it needs to get. Because uh, the world need hood whore. <laughs> now, if you can donate, go to Cash App, dollar sign hood whore. I'll put it down. i put the link down there in the comments. Um, you know, the dollar sign hood whore. You know, go ahead and send your brother a couple dollars, man, you know. Send me a couple of dollars, make me holler. A little bit of change, I do something strange. <laughs> All right, here we go. The camaraderie between my friends and I went beyond race and racial issues that were hidden just beneath the surface. When we were together, we were just friends. Don't get me wrong. We were all well aware that we were you know, black, white, or Asian. And when we interacted with each other, it was under the clear implication of who we were in contrast to each other in the eyes of the world and its nonsense. We often threw these crazy um, big statements at each other, you know, just making fun with each other. Like, even you ain't black enough for that. Or you white, you should feel right at home doing this or that. That was our way of breaking, you know, the monotony of the everyday routine and how we were viewed. We wanted nothing more than to be our usual misfit selves without the pressure that was placed on us by society. Now, however, after what went on at the plantation, life for all of us changed. Good, bad, and indifferent, we was affected. Now, with Justin, Jacob, and Candy now gone, the emptiness was in stark contrast to the fun-loving, playful banter, and genuine friendship that we once had. Now, we were fractured. And we didn't splinter all at once. We suffered unending whispered accusations and stares. More than I would like to admit of comments of whisper, whisper, their kind. Hmm. So basically, after what happened when they're on the plantation, I guess folks was blaming them or saying they ain't telling the whole story. And really, once you look at the story, you really can't blame them because... You know, nothing else makes sense. You know, so that's how people is, man. Like, it got to make sense to people, you know. <sighs> Shoot. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I was innocent or that I didn't snatch a few girls into the bathroom for a talk about the situation of verbiage spewing from their mouth. Look, like my sister, she had the, uh, she said she liked using uh, exotic words, uh, words with a whole lot of flavor, a lot of, uh, okay, no, no, no. She like big, big words. There we go. She like big words. She like using them big old words, them, uh, you know, she like using them, them words with a bunch of, uh, bunch of consonants. I think that's what you call them. So, you know, she, uh, so y'all, I'm trying to, uh, what I usually do when I be reading stories that ain't written the way I would wrote it, <laughs> it ain't, it ain't wrote in the, if it ain't wrote in the way that I would have written it, <laughs> you know, uh, I try to sauce it up while I'm reading it. So, but she wrote it so, she wrote it so, so proper. So I could just read it how she wrote it. I might just read it how she wrote it. So. If, uh, yeah, my, that's what I do. No, nah, I got to sauce it up. I got to sauce it up. But you know, I ain't put the word verbiage. <laughs> you never said that in my whole life. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Man, my talking so, man, my talking so bad. So I'm trying to do this job application, this job interview for, uh, what's it called? I'm trying to do a job interview for the for work at home customer service rep thing. And I'm trying to lie on the interview. <laughs> well, I'm trying to lie. I'm trying to answer. I'm trying to come up with the answers to the questions off the top of my head and lie at the same time. And it's hard to it's hard to tell a lie and speak uh, properly at the same time. So yeah, I ain't even finished the interview, man. I, I just I just went on to hit that X. 
<laughs> it took me, I man, it took me about thirty. No, nah, it was about long. It was about one hour I spent on one question. I said, man, look, I ain't finna do it. I, if I gotta do all this line to get the job, I don't need it. So anyway, uh, let's say so. She took some girls up in the bathroom and beating them up. Yeah, that's how you do it, man. You got to take somebody in the bathroom and beat them down there and now and then. <laughs> Which you usually had sympathetic teachers wanting to know, us to know that we were there, that they were there for us during our difficult time. Now, after a while, it was assumed by the police and the school that Tars, Chase, and Jules had simply just been runaways due to being troubled youths, which angered the rest of us. We knew... Uh, we knew them differently, and no one would listen to us. Oh, we knew differently. We knew that one. The <coughs> we knew that one the truth, and nobody would listen to us. And yes, Julie had a bit of a difficult home life, and Chase was constantly trying to fit in and prove himself. But the same couldn't be said for Tasha. She had a great home life. Her parents was well off, and she was the youngest of only two, and by all accounts, spoiled rotten. Although she wasn't happy with her home life due to the pressure that her parents put on her to go into a profession that she hated the idea of, there was no way that either of them would um, have ran away. Now, the increase in stress took its toll on our friendship, which was reduced to silent nods in the hallway. We spoke in hushed conversations on the bus ride home, but nothing like we used to uh, do months ago. And eventually, my life took a drastic turn. Man, this junk make this make a good movie, man. Cause see, the average horror movie, the end of the movie would have been them going in the to the old plantation, and the, uh, and the, I think it was a big fireman or something. And the big fireman, um, you know, the fireman took some of the kids. But see, in the real you know, that ain't, see, that's why they be messing up. Like, yeah, yeah, that's scary or whatever. But the real horror is dealing with things after that. It's like, um, like I was watching one of them exorcism movies. I think it was the exorcism of Emily Rose. Uh, I'm finna spoil the movie. You don't trust me. You ain't missing nothing. Just your basic exorcism found footage type movie or whatever, man. So the girl <coughs> was all crazy. Then the exorcist came and exorcised her. And by the time they got done working out, she killed everybody, I think. And then was just riding through the streets, tearing up the world. So it's like, man, I want to see the movie of her tearing up the world. You know, I, that's what I want to see. Like, the whole how she got there was cool, but her tearing stuff up, that's the real movie. That's what I, you know, that's what I really want to see. All right, so... um. I blamed myself for the turn that my father took in life. After 16 years in the military, he was given an honorable discharge purely for years of service, but by this point, he was a stone addict. I can tell you that I was a misfit child, being raised by a military man turned mechanic. I was a bit tomboyish. <clears throat> I spent many days in overalls helping my daddy under various hoods or cars and was proud to be able to help my daddy fix a car. Say what you want, but being a girl was never a great benefit to me growing up. I laugh to this day on the many days that my daddy came home mortified that I was outside in the neighborhood with the boys playing football and them itchy stockings and his idea of my best dress. Serves him right for attempting to subtly make me feminine with those horribly, horribly itchy stockings and those restrictive, suffocating dresses. <coughs> I was doing just fine in jeans and a t-shirt. You know, so, yeah, she was Tom Tom boy. Out there playing football? Hooey. Hey, if you see a girl on the football field, she out there for a reason, though. Just like if you see a girl playing basketball, she ain't out there for no reason. <laughs> that girl out there for a reason, so. So anyway, uh, once my daddy became an addict, I took on the guilt, thinking that I was the cause. Man, now that's crazy. Like, you know, it's just like um, victims, man. Victims 
start blaming themselves. That's why you got to be careful what you expose your kids to, man, because then your kid growing up thinking they the problem, man, and it be you the whole time. Uh, now, the prior incident was life-altering. Years later, when my daddy had beaten his addiction, he told me <coughs> that his addiction had nothing to do with me. Y'all excuse me, man. I'm a little sick, man. You know, I work outside, and uh, I be out there in the elements and the weather changing, so you know how it go, man. You know, It ain't the Rona. You know, it ain't the Rona. I already beat the Rona, man. Uh you know, if she come back, you know, I got a little something for her now. I already beat her one time, so I think I'm good. I think it's just, it's just a regular cold, man. It ain't the Rona, because when you get the Rona, you be sleepy, boy. Like, I'm talking about sleeping 16 hours a day, 20 hours a day. So, you know, I ain't been real sleepy, so I know it's just a regular cold. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see where I'm at, where I'm at, where I'm at. Uh, he said his addiction, addiction had nothing to do with me, that it was hidden for years. And he was first exposed to drug use in Vietnam when he was a soldier of only 16, 17 years old. Spent his life running from the images that no child his age should have seen. Boy, that Vietnam wasn't no joke, man. My grandparents fearing that harm would come to him being a young radical secretly joining the Baltimore chapter of the Black Panthers. Uh, decided that military service was the safest option. Little did they comprehend that him being a youth did not make him exempt from being sent to war. To them, he was their baby. To the U.S. military, he was a soldier. If you are oldest enough to hold a gun, you are old enough to go to war. <clears throat> the assumption of my 14-year-old mind was his inability to handle my adventurous nature, that usually caused him many times an eye roll and a head shake for him and the repeated question of, what am I going to do with you, child? Many times that expression uh, put a, he had a proud smile, but sometimes he just walked away. That was life for me at that point, isolated. Now, schoolwork, Often home alone, my dad is somewhat um, chasing his next hit. I retreated into the solace of my books and draw her X-Men comments and the Mighty Thor. Work was humdrum. Oh, you know how to draw? Draw me some. Send it to me on email or something. Any of y'all that know how to draw, send it to me on my email. Hoodhorecreepypasta at gmail.com. And I use your art in my hood whore poetry book that's coming at some point in the future, <laughs> at some point, hopefully soon, man. Um, <clears throat> work was humdrum and school a blur. Senior year still working, I eventually started dating a fellow co-worker, Thomas. Now, after months of dating, I decided to tell him about past events. My not being able to confide in anyone all these years had me feeling as if I was losing my mind and did it really all happen. Did they really run away? I half expected him to tease me and not believe me. Being black, we don't tend to delve into the supernatural or anything dealing with Ouija boards. Seances are running headlong in a danger. Um, Y'all know I own a Ouija board. I done had that mug for like, shoot, I think going on two years, man. I was supposed to do a video with it, but I don't know, man. I be wanting to do um stuff, but then I be like, dang, if I do this... And I spent all that time doing that. I wonder, is anybody going to watch it? So sometimes, like, I be wanting to do other stuff. But, like, the only thing that really, it, it kind of hurt me to do other types of stuff other than, like, just scary stories. Because the scary stories get the most views. And when I do other stuff and it don't get a lot of views, then YouTube think that I'm not putting out good content. Because it's like, dang, why, why, why his views ain't consistently going up or whatever? So that's why a lot of times I be having ideas but never really put them into action, man. So when y'all look at, watch everything I do and like everything I do, it really helps, man. Uh, <clears throat> 
So yeah, you know, black folk gonna be down for all that stuff, man. You yeah. know. So um, but he didn't. He just held me, kissed my forehead, told me that he believed me and that it was okay to not have answers to what happened. And surprisingly, that made me feel, you know, lighter and freer. After a while, I told him about my childhood experiences on our way walking to work. And to my surprise, he shared his own childhood experience with the supernatural. We often went into abandoned houses that we passed on the way to work, making plans for our future together. You see, in Baltimore, at one point, you could, you could buy an abandoned house for a dollar. And if you were willing to fix it up, and Thomas and I were determined that we were going to purchase a whole neighborhood, fix up our dream home, then fix the rest up for family and friends. Old to the ambition and dreams of children, teens, and young adults in the hood. It was a particular house that Thomas and I, I heard about that one dollar abandoned house thing, man. I heard about it, I guess that's the government way of trying to... Um, get folk to to fix the hood up but then I wonder who was able to get these houses was it people from the hood did you have to live in the hood to get this house or could anybody just come in and pay that dollar and get that house man so you know you always gotta they be opening up the door but then they let everybody in and they end up cause now when they come in and they buy the house for a dollar and they fix it up, they're going to make the rent so high that somebody who living in the hood not going to be able to afford to stay there anyway. You know? Or they going to charge and never fix none and never do nothing because they're like, you in the hood anyway, what you going to do? Who you going to call? You know, pay your rent, leave me alone. Slumlords. So it was one particular house that Thomas and I had our eyes on. We saw it repeatedly on our way to work. And at the corner of Reister Town Road and Liberty Heights to the right was Mondo, Mondo, Wom, Mondoman, where we worked. Now on Reister Town Road, there were apartments to, to the right, but on the left was the original entrance to Druid Hill Park prior to the city selling off pieces of it for development. And it's still three buildings, a beautiful baby doll house, much like the miniature doll houses that I loved as a kid. A large stone st stable house, which still stands and has since been remodeled. You should look it up. It's on Lucas Street, and I was flabbergasted when I was led home to see it. It's gorgeous. <laughs> and I wasn't in awe enough, and I wasn't in awe enough to journey there, but I like what they did. And I guess they are city offices now. And then there was a smaller building. We never figured it out what it was for, but we figured that we'd figure it out when we purchased it. Now, we figured that since it was three buildings that they would want the very least, you know, $3 for it. And I was okay with that. We talked so much about going into those homes that one day after partying at his brother's house the night prior for his father, for his brother's birthday... Neither of us wanted to go to work, nor did we have the common sense to call out properly. So off we walked, and as we passed the homes, it was my suggestion to finally go inspect the house for our future endeavor. Now Thomas, Thomas thought about it, but then he said, nah. I had a strong composure to see the inside of the house, so I insisted. And we were both lethargic from partying the night prior, and lethargic mean tired <laughs> from partying the night prior and then want to work uh, which was our constant complaint as we walked we had the ingenious idea to call in sick I know we were young and stupid it's okay I was young and stupid I'm even older and stupid now <laughs> the, the age change but the stupid don't <laughs> you know so Boy, I look back and I'd be like, gosh, dog, I can't believe I did something that dang stupid. What the heck was I thinking? I can't believe I just did that last week. <laughs> so mug be looking back on stuff they did 10 years ago. I'd be looking back on stuff I did 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so anyway, 
We stopped at the payphone, called in sick, and off to the homes we went. And the stable home was inaccessible due to the collapsing roof. And the smaller building was shuttered, so we went to the main house, which is now just a field next to the remodeled stabled house. My first instinct was to look up at the attic. Despite the sun shining fully onto it, it was still pitch black. I didn't get an ominous, a scary feeling, so I continued on. Once we entered the house, it was bright, sunny, cheerful, and the sun yellow painting made it all the more appealing. Sun yellow paint, I guess. It was huge. And here I was making plans on which room would be the parlor where we would host important guests, and a living room, which has to be our family space, the dining section, another room to the right of the kitchen, the children's playroom, stairs, stairs, playroom, and toward the back of the kitchen, it was dark, tiny, and cramped, which was to be expected. It was, after all, the back of the house, and the windows was boarded. Now, Thomas cheered me by promising to learn how to do carpentry work and make it bigger for me, and I immediately headed up the back stairs to explore the upper part of the house. I went from room to room making plans on how many children we was going to have and calling out to Thomas which rooms would go to who. <coughs> Man, this is an abandoned house? Like, y'all didn't have no, no crackheads? <laughs> Wasn't no crackheads there? Shoot, man, I ain't going to no kind of abandoned house, man. Not no hood, well, no, uh, not in the hood, maybe. Uh-uh, nah, not in the hood. Mm-mm. Hey, man, them crackheads, man. Nah, uh-uh, you, they be, thank you, they be like, treat you like you walking in their house. Technically, you is walking in their house. Now, I reach in the attic, which was a beautiful spiral wrought iron staircase. I called out to Thomas. Excited, stating that he had to see this, and it was beautiful, and he would love it. Expecting his voice to come from one of the other rooms that we were exploring, I was surprised to hear it come from the attic. Come up here. Now, looking, you know, I got startled. I looked up. I said, what are you doing up there? He said again, come up here. You got to see this. I was a bit leery, not because <clears throat> he was up there, but because it was dark. It would be my luck that I'd trip on something and break my neck, ruining our future plans. Looking at that pitch black figure, wondering how he was able to see anything in that much darkness, I called to him again. Thomas, it's dark up here. How are you seeing anything? And he called down to me again. Come up here. You got to see this. Now, assuming that it must have been uh, more light than once you got to the top, I started to climb. Hand on the railing and one foot on the stairs when Thomas came up the back stairs and said, Who are you talking to? Ooh, see, this what I'm talking about. And it's raining and junk outside, too, man. This why I don't, this why I ain't read your story in all this time, man. When did she send me this? <clears throat> she sent me this story, June the 12th. And I'm just now reading, because your junk too scary. Too dang scary. <laughs> Shoot. We'll write a story so they ain't scary and I wouldn't be uh, taking so long to read. Man. He stated again, come up here, you got to see this. Dang, so the demon ghost still running his mouth even after the boy didn't already? Oh, no, no, hold on. I'm, I'm in the wrong spot. I'm up here. I'm in the wrong spot. Uh... So, so, where, yeah, so now the boy walked up and said, who are you talking to? Now, stunned, I looked to him and asked why <clears throat> he was there when I heard him upstairs asking me to come up. Now, as I said this, I was turning and pointing up into the attic when whatever that dark figure was moved. And it moved sideways as if it was coming down the steps. Now, right at that moment, I wanted to know parts of what was up there and ran towards Thomas. Now, let me take a moment to tell you briefly what Thomas looked like. Gorgeous dark chocolate, skin like silk, pearly white teeth, kind eyes, and a megawatt smile that seemed to always stay plastered to his face. I have no idea what he saw coming down those steps behind me, but he hid it. I never knew a man beautifully dark as him 
that could almost turn white. His eyes got big as plates. He grabbed my wrist and took off down the front steps. The force in which he snatched me took my feet out from under me, but he was going so fast that I didn't fall. I kept calling, Thomas, stop, what are you doing? I'm falling. I kept attempting to grab the banister to break my eventual fall, but to no avail. Now, had I not been so focused on Thomas' fearful flight and my impending fall, I may have seen what he saw. And if I had looked up at the banister, I would have seen through the spokes, you know, what frightened him. But I didn't. I was trying my best not to fall and calling out to him. And my feet were turning into themselves, but more so to grip the head on my arm like he was threatening to like, almost break it. <clears throat> now, when we reached the bottom floor, the moment that my foot hit solid ground, down I was going with Thomas still dragging me. I never hit the floor. Now, however, something pushed me with such force that I collided in the Thomas, sending, up bo sending us both um, careening out the door and down the steps. Now, as we tumbled down the steps, the door slammed shut. After it slammed shut, something hit it with enough force that I thought the door would just splinter into a bunch of pieces. Now, I looked at Thomas and said, Thomas, what did you see? What was that? He ain't said a word. He snatched me from the ground, still running. The only thing he said the whole time is, we have to pray, we have to go to church. That boy said, we got to go to church. <laughs> hey, Thomas, you a smart man, boy. You ain't lying. Now, Thomas wasn't much for church going, but that was all he would say. He ain't stop running until we were past Douglas High School on Pulaski Avenue. And I repeatedly asked him what he saw, and he refused to tell me. Now, finally, when we got to Fort and North Avenue, he sat on the steps of an abandoned home and just cried. Now, that Sunday, we went to church, and after that, he went to church every Sunday. And I also noticed a serious change in him. And she say, uh, and she ain't like to go to church from being forced to go as a youth. And in white churches, you in there three hours. Black churches, 8 a.m. till 5. Go eat, come back 7 p.m. down till midnight. Uh, I go to a church that is mixed that only happens to have black people in it. But it's not a black church now. You know, I don't go to no black church. I go to a church for everybody. <laughs> we just only happen to have black members at this point in time, but I'm sure one day we have some uh, some different folks up in there. And she said, no, nah, she didn't want the church life. No, she didn't want the Christian life. So Thomas dumped her and found him a girl that loved Jesus just as much as he did. <clears throat> and hey, Thomas, you know, that's how, hey, just, she said, was I hurt? Absolutely. freaking lootly it just is what it is, man. Um, you know, I, I ain't going to tell folk, you know, what to believe in, but I tell you this. You and your wife, or y'all you, better believe the same thing. Amen. Don't marry no woman. Don't believe the same thing you believe. You better, you know, I'll be telling, man, my younger brothers and stuff, man, look, y'all be dating these girls. You better find out what they believe in, man. Because when I was young, I messed around and dated at least one witch that I know of. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They be on some stuff. You better watch out. You better figure out what that girl believe. <laughs> you better figure that junk out quick. She said, did I understand? Yes. Something in that house that he saw scared him so bad that religion became his solace. And later years, he became the manager of Burger King, which was something he always said that he would do. And I still contacted him periodically just to let him know that I was okay. And we would talk for a while, then the awkward silence would follow. And after his wife caught wind that we were in contact, she lost her soup. <laughs> I guess that means she went, she went off on him, right? Yeah. And I stopped contacting him. Now, some years later, his brother, who was a truck driver, reached out to me on Facebook and like genuinely, genuinely happy to see me. And we talked about how life has progressed for both of us. 
He told me about Thomas and he and his wife are still happily married and honestly, I was happy for him. We talked about my husband and suddenly I asked his brother if Thomas ever eventually got around to telling him what he saw that day. And the only thing is that Bruce said was, yeah, he saw you. Gosh, dog. Dang. What? He saw you. That was the last time that I spoke to Thomas's brother. I wonder to this day what he meant by he saw me. I clearly heard Thomas's voice coming from upstairs. So shouldn't I have, shouldn't it have been him that he saw? I don't know and I decided that it's better to never know. Oh, y'all hear that rain? Bro, the rain just started hitting super hard when I read that last sentence. I don't know if y'all can hear it. I got the mic turned down. Let me turn the mic up some. Man, can y'all hear that? Bro, soon as I read that last sentence, the rain started coming down super hard. Natty, if I find out you some kind of witch voodoo priestess and you messing with me, I'm going to be real upset. But I ain't going to lie to you, Nat. You know, you're my sister, so I got to keep it real with you. <coughs> um, Thomas found out he he saw he he basically Thomas saw um, from from what I got from this story he saw the dark side of you. I don't know if it's something that you got hidden or something that you could do because like we all could be super dark if we wanted to I guess or give in to it or whatever you want to call it. So maybe Thomas saw like, or maybe Thomas saw that uh, you just uh, ain't the one that's gonna put up for some nonsense or something later on. And he was playing games or something. You never, I don't know, man. But this is something that Thomas seen that uh, something he seen in you, man. That uh, I think that scared him off of you. Cause that's that's crazy. He saw, he saw you. Dang, I like, I man, gosh, dog. Like, man, imagine you go somewhere with your lady, right? And you and your lady, you know, y'all, y'all, y'all in the house, y'all in the creepy place, and y'all looking around. So then you see her headed upstairs, and you catch her at the bottom of the stairs, and you look up, and you see her halfway up the stairs, but at the top. You see like the demon version of her. Boy. I'm surprised he took you. Like I I'm surprised he didn't leave you with the with the demon version. And so gosh, dog. That's some scary stuff. All right, Natty um. Uh that's enough stories from you for 2020, okay? Anything else you got? And I don't know how, I don't know how you, how do you even put up with life? How do you sleep? How do you, how do you go out at night by yourself? How do you take the trash out, like, at night? Like, how is you existing with this terrible, with these terrible uh, experiences, Man, I ain't never had no supernatural experience. So, to me, it just blows my mind on anybody that got something that they can't answer. Anybody who got an experience they can't answer and live with that junk, I don't know how you do it. Because to me, it just seemed like it's just it's too freaking much, man. It's just way, It's just way too much. So Natty, oh my goodness, uh, sister, I love you, and uh, but don't send me no more stories. Uh, 
for the rest of 2020. I, this, I need a couple of... I'm going to need a cut because this go, is this, this going to stick with me right here, man. Gosh, dog. Sheesh.